Great, let's get started. Welcome to this plenary fireside chat on igniting innovation to address global challenges. My name is Victoria Slivkov. I am the Executive Managing Director of Extreme Tech Challenge. I'm honored to be joined by Young Sung, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur whose passion is building businesses and fostering emerging technologies that have the potential to transform the world for the better. Currently, Mr. Sung serves as chairman of the board at Harman International and senior advisor to Samsung Electronics. Most recently, Mr. Sung served as corporate president and chief strategy officer of Samsung Electronics, where he led strategy for global innovation, investment, new business creation, and led the company's $8 billion acquisition of Harman International, the global leader in connected car solutions. On a day-to-day -day basis, Mr. Sung is an active investor and advisor for startups and businesses uh, at a global scale. He was also a seed investor in some of the industry's most innovative companies, including Ring, Fungible, Berkeley Lights, and Zoom. Mr. Sung co-founded Extreme Tech Challenge, or XTC, the world's largest startup competition for entrepreneurs addressing global challenges. And he also hosts the Next Wave video uh, interview series. I look forward to a great conversation on the emerging technologies that are impacting the world in a big way, how best to develop and execute on an innovation strategy for a large uh, multinational corporation, the playbook for developing a global ecosystem to accelerate tech for good, and his advice to startups on how to navigate the complexities of catching the next wave of opportunities. Chairman Sung, welcome. Oh, thank you, Victoria. Good to see you again. Good to see you. I feel like this is a great time for us to talk about tech for good. As we've seen from the most, uh, the most recent pandemic, technology has been transformative in creating new solutions and opportunities. Um, innovation is happening at a faster pace, as we've seen, and the call for global cooperation has never been more imperative. Um, you've been a successful tech investor and entrepreneur for over three decades and have seen the evolution of trends from the genesis of Silicon Valley spawned by chips, um, then equipment, software, then came the Internet and then the share economy. What is exciting to you right now, looking ahead in the next five to ten years? What would you say are the next waves of fundamental shifts in technologies that are breaking frontiers today? Yeah, open all of us in tech, we describe the wave of technologies. I would say that we are in a fifth wave of technology evolution. And of course, there are different perspectives on it. But you could say the 50s and 60s were the mainframes that can be able to automate number of uh, functions, uh, including payment systems and others. And then, of course, the mini computer era came along with personal computers that gave the power of a decentralized compute. And then, of course, the next wave was Internet, which enables to all of us get connected around the world. And then the fourth wave would have been the cloud and mobility that can be able to run applications, not locally, but be able to run it in cloud in a real time. Where we are today is, I think, what we call data economy era. And next, this wave is really driven by data plus AI that are really accelerating number of applications that can be able to change many of the things we do today because of the data that can be able to give much better insight than what we have done before. So if you think about traditional industry like FinTech or InsureTech, will be even disrupted because of the data that we have. Instead of making decisions on insurance policies based on demographics like we have done, now we have a lot more data about the person, their information that can be uh, giving you much better insights. So we can have much more precision uh, plans. Uh, this could be health, it could be insurance, it could be intact. That can give you a much better risk assessment uh, which in turn, I think you can be able to manage it uh, much better than it had been. Now, one have to really think about in data economy, security and privacy issues going along with the ethics of AI. So it's not all great. There is a good news, but there's also caution that we have to think about in how to balance technology along with the uh, ethics and the policies of privacy 
as well as the security of data that can be able to go and being able to be useful but not going into some wrong hand. Yeah, so as you mentioned, we've seen how these enabling technologies like cloud, AI, data economy um, have really celebrated innovation in sectors such as mobility and healthcare. Um, an example that comes to mind is the role of IT in the rapid development of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Uh, what typically is a three to 10 year process to bring a vaccine to market, it has been nothing short of remarkable that we've been able to do this in 15 months. Uh, what are some of the other ways you see data and computing capabilities that are transforming healthcare? Um, just share some expect, uh, perspectives on how these emerging technologies are impacting society. I think there are multiple ways I see the data can really change the way we do things. Uh, for instance, telehealth has not been something that taken off, but during the pandemic, more and more people realized that they could be able to use the knowledge tree that are based and they can give you insight around your diagnostics before you run into the hospital. So you can be able to understand all the symptom checkers. So there is a company that we are involved called Ada Health that can give you symptom checker before you can run into whether you have certain diseases or issues that you have to deal with. At least there are certain early warning system that can be able to help you with insight. There's also the mobile phone apps that can be able to monitor your behavior. That can give you certain warning signs about potentially having issues with the mental uh, symptoms. And it doesn't mean they're the right solution, but it does give you the trend. Someone who's been using phone, which as you know, we, we look at our phones a uh, number of times. Most humans are using probably 153 times a day looking at their apps. So uh, uh, when that person is doing much less than that, and sending less messages, or not calling, not responding, you know, that does give you some warning signs about uh, whether there's something that we should understand better about the insights. All about your nutrition, being able to monitor the food intake, as well as understanding your bioscience from heart rate variability, all the way to potentially blood pressure, hopefully around glucose level, so that you can be able to triangulate potential uh, food intake that can be able to manage your glucose levels in a, in a before you hit a certain peak, uh, which I think will give you a much more uh, linear management of di diets as well. So there are so many implications of this data in a way that I think we are there, but it was just early stage of the game. I think that this will evolve. Sensors are going to get better. They're going to be more accurate. Information is going to be better organized. Our policy needs to be managing the, the information sharing of what to share, what not to share, how do you aggregate, how do you make things uh, making sense to make it uh, anonymous so that it's not uh, invading privacy of the uh, uh, individuals and the co uh, customers. Yeah, so I want to zero in on cloud-based technologies because it's, it's definitely a game changer in, in terms of enabling all these uh, new features and new possibilities that users share. Um, it, you know, as we think about cloud-based technologies and services that are catering to this rapid digital transformation, you were early to spot this trend a number of, uh, of years ago. In fact, um, you began to work on this uh, earlier in your career while at Intel uh, about three decades ago. Um, it is no coincidence that you were an early investor in Zoom. Um, so what were the signals then that helped you form this investment thesis? And also share with us some additional examples of how um, cloud-based technologies are driving innovations and other use cases. Well, I think that uh, cloud is really in many ways enabling us to do things that are much uh, longer distance that we might not be able to do it in the past. Most of the applications in the past was running locally with the local servers and, the, uh, and then you have to use your back uh, room communication to do it. Obviously, the bandwidth improved, so we can do things much more real time. Um, and I think that was a very important contribution. Uh, but I think the, uh, when I look at Zoom, and when I met Eric Yuan, the CEO, it was a uh, December of 2011. And I remember that discussion because at the time, Eric told me that there are many other choices. Uh, WebEx was there. You know, Skype was there, Go Meeting was there. So people were not that excited about investing into another video company. 
But what I liked about him was there are three things I really liked it. One was that um, he believes using cloud technology, one can be able to not download their apps and yet being able to send the link and being able to click the link, you can be able to join the call. It sounds really obvious, but back then, uh, everybody had to download via their apps and they have to connect it. So this whole change made it so much easier than uh, normal experience. I think second one that I really liked was that, of course, as a mobile phone person, when he said, yeah, I want people to use mobile phone to communicate, not using the PC or notebook only. And I want to have 50 people that can sign in simultaneously. They can run that. Now, it sounds good, but the truth is you need a really good codec uh, technology, compression and decompression technology that can be able to give you that capabilities Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi using the uh, technologies like 3G and 4G at the time. So with the 5G, maybe this is not an issue. Back then, it was an issue. So I think having the efficient technology in the back was a real breakthrough. Lastly, I think he knew the user experience problem must be addressed. Make it really easy to make it, make it easy to create an ecosystem and partners. These are three obvious ones that he attacked. And I think you may not say it's a big revolutionary, but we do know that millions of people are using this tool. And during the pandemic, I think all of us are Zooming and Zoom became the vocabulary. And I'm very happy that Zoom can contribute portion, part of this connecting communities tighter than we could have been during the pandemic time. Yeah, and Yang, 10 years later, Zoom is ubiquitous. So um, you know that really is a testament to uh, your foresight. I want to pivot a bit, a little bit about talking about um, the innovation efforts that you led, you led while you're at Samsung. You shifted the company from a product-centric strategy to a consumer-centric strategy where you brought hardware and software capabilities together to create a conversion experience for the, the consumer. Um, tell us more about there, particularly how it applies to smart mobility and how did this inform your strategic decision to lead Samsung's $8 billion acquisition of Harman? Well, you know, I think that uh, Harman has the uh, two core capabilities for those people that doesn't know. One is that it's an audio company. It's really known for its brand for JBL, mm -hmm. Harman Kardon, Infinity, AKG, and others. So that's the brand that people are associate with. And the other part is really applying the brand into automotive applications. And what we liked about Harman was that we see auto industry, and this is 2017, we made the decision that the automobile of tomorrow is not the automobile of today. So there will be a four things that will be fundamentally changed in our view. And one was really all about this idea of user interface are going to change much more a smartphone experience than the traditional car experience. We also saw the electrification will come in, the so battery-driven engine, where in the traditional, it had been combustion engine that was going on for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden, now you need the batteries, you need the motors, and they can just change the whole experience of the automobile. We also saw that 5G will come in, and we see that connectivity is going to become really important. And lastly, autonomous. And I know we're not here today that we are driving without driverless, but you can imagine that is getting better. There are different degree of safety and there are the different degree of autonomous. And we are about halfway there. And I think you will see it's getting even more and safer as we are evolving what we call autonomous driving technologies. So, um, the radar technology, the camera technology, the LiDAR technology coming together and fusing the information and then being able to use the connectivity to be able to looking at the uh, objects that are in front, in the back, around your car, along with the uh, path you are going. And this whole idea of autonomous is, in a way, the future of the uh, automobile was really a smartphone with a big wheels on it. And that's the really imagination that we had. And this is why we thought Harman would be a great pick because it also brings the experience of audio and video Samsung has. Combination, then you can entertain the people that are inside the car. So that was the visualization we had and we thought that would be a good acquisition for us. 
Yeah. And with the advancement of AI and the proliferation of applications and use cases, uh, as you had just shared with us, there are also concerns about potential misuses and unintended consequences um, to you know, enlarge inequalities. So how should we begin to think about and address the ethics of AI? Well, first of all, I think that AI is neutral. It's not really um, a biased, but the data, the data that we are feeding into AI can create a bias. So if your data has a bias, then of course the machine learning process that are learning from it will have the bias. So for instance, that if you're profiling certain, um, certain target groups of people for uh, projects and training it certain way that are biased, then obviously you're going to be self-selecting around that. So it's really important that data that we're feeding is not biased. And that's the number one issue that we have to deal with. And then I think that a machine is going to uh, be a very important part of automating our process. But I don't believe that it can replace our, uh, our thinking, our brain. So in many ways, it will be complementary. So if you train it like what we are doing for, uh, let's say, translation, having a simultaneous translation uh, that can be able to train with the language, that can give you a different kind of the sound and understanding, that is very, very doable, and I think it's already happening. You can see the uh, applications that are driven sound and voice is really improving daily. Also, you can see the imaging recognition. Uh, I think in the beginning, it was much less than human, accuracy-wise, like 93% uh, 10 years ago. Today, it is far better than humans. So you can actually train video images based on, let's say, X-ray on your heart conditions or lungs, whatever, and being able to, using those data, being able to give you even better diagnostic than maybe even doctors can do, maybe. And it's something that I believe that uh, 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 potentially automating the process and helping us to be productive. And that's an opportunity that I see as well. So we're talking about all these technologies that can impact the lives of many. Um, and that segues into talking about a passion initiative of yours. Two years ago, um, at the largest tech conference in Europe, Viva Tech, you made an announcement to launch Extreme Tech Challenge. Uh, uh, the most is the global ecosystem that brings together big corporations and startups to tackle global challenges inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, Extreme Tech Challenger XCC is now active in almost 100 countries across six continents. What is your vision for this ecosystem and what are you hoping to accomplish? Why is it important that XCC is performing on a global scale? Yeah, I think this was really an important mission for me. I was in a, uh, a CEO concert with President Macron at the time, and we're discussing tech for good. And we're talking about how technology can be able to support uh, it can improve sustainability, improve health, improve inclusion. We talked about these core values that are really started by uh, former UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon. And I was thinking, how can I help? What can I do as a executive? So I created a nonprofit with my friend Bill Tai to enable us to join in with a number of startup companies and mobilizing startups to work with the corporations to accelerate the innovation path. So that was just uh, the story behind Extreme Tech Challenge. So we announced that without knowing how big that's going to be. And as you know, now this year, we're going to have over 3,700 companies that applied from around all over the world. And we had a many regional competition from all over the world that are projecting number of exciting companies that are making the difference. So the idea really was around how do I make an impact on my own? But by mobilizing the things I do, I talk to a lot of startups and I have a lot of corporate relationships. By using the startups corporation, we can create a highway of innovation and corporation can sponsor it. Startups can be able to get exposure and support. In the process, I think we can give some great examples that can be able to make a positive impact on sustainability. And it truly takes a village, a global village in this case, to build a better world through disruptive technologies that are fundamentally changing how we tackle 
these problems um, from climate change to providing more access to health care to democratizing opportunities across uh, large and, and small cities alike. Um, startups are key drivers to this innovation. Um, so share with us, how can stakeholders of this whole village, uh, many of the people that are joining this call right now, the corporations, VCs, policymakers, how can we better engage and support these companies? You know, I think that um, and many often the innovative ideas come from startups because they take risk. Corporations can sponsor it, but often the risk taking takes time and until it's proven. So the, it's a really important ecosystem to work together. So I think every stakeholders in this room had an opportunity to contribute. I know, for instance, in France, they have a really big, uh, startup events now that are encouraging startups to uh, engage, bring their ideas, and accelerate the journey. But the real issue is really scale up. How do you build these companies bigger? Because that's where the jobs are. So we need to figure out how to scale up, which means having the right venture capital, uh, I think having the right exit plans, having the right partners, and that is as important as having a startup environment. And then the lastly, I think we need to have a program where these companies can work with others and they can drive the innovation. And to do that, I think there is a lot of things we can do. Government obviously can play a big role in uh, uh, helping the startups, scale ups, and focusing also on major agenda the company, the, the government is dealing with. And then of course, the uh, venture capitalists and the corporation can be of support financially with a partnership. So um, I think everybody can play a role. And XTC that you're involved with, um, I'm involved with, can be a brand that any of you that want to do and create a contribution through UN17 sustainability objectivity, then can be able to get engaged. So I'm really excited that we can all be able to play a part. And I'm hoping that uh, the global event that we are really putting together uh, can be shared through all of you because I think some we have some really exciting companies that can contribute, that can make the difference. And, and you know, I'm so honored and privileged to be in this position to work with you, Young, to continue to scale um, Extreme Tech Challenge to a division of you and, and build ties. So it's, it's terrific looking at the potential going forward. Um, so now, and you mentioned this already, we want to talk a little bit about the successful startups that have come out of XCC ecosystem. Um, can you just share with us a couple of examples? Sure. Uh, in Europe, there are maybe a couple of examples that are really exciting. Uh, it's a company from Ireland called Microgen. And uh, the idea really was the uh, uh, entrepreneur that came from the uh, biotech. And she felt that uh, toxicity on the soil is a big problem. So how do you create a microbiome that can be able to protect the uh, seed, whether it's a wheat or rice, that can be able to protect it from toxic soils so that you can be able to uh, generate uh, minimizing the toxics that can go into your plant, mm -hmm. as well as really uh, yield improvement, because when you have less toxic, you're going to have a better productivity, as well as really managing the uh, toxic uh, issues around the land management. So these are the some of huge implications that one we are, we are dealing with today. And I think the... Um, there are billions of people that are dealing with today that has the, uh, we call the heavy metals in our food and being able to managing the source of this plant base through the management of soil, management of the uh, biome technology that can be able to give you a better selection of the seed that can be able to protect from toxicity is a really important part of the journey. And the, uh, we're really very excited that they, they were one of our winners. Uh, in fact, she won the uh, Agri segment mm -hmm. as well as the Entrepreneur of a Woman Leadership Award as well. So, I mean, so uh, I think that uh, that's one example. There's another company called Rewire from Israel. And their idea was really creating a banking opportunity for migrants. When the migrants go from, let's say, India to Germany, or from um, Syria migrants that are going into uh, uh, some of the European countries, or the just uh, migrants that are going Middle East to work in Dubai. 
all the people need some kind of credit and their, their ability to then communicate and ship their money to their homeland. And the traditionally, it has been very expensive and it was very cumbersome. By using the uh, mobile technology, one can be able to create a new banking capabilities and service that can give you much, much lower cost than traditional means. In the process, now they're helping half a million people with almost half tri- half trillion dollar worth of the uh, transactions uh, that are happening on their account. So I think those are the examples of great goal, enabling those people that might not be able to have the right tools to use and at the right price point, and therefore it's an economic way of doing it. And so I'm really happy that Rewire was one of our fintech uh, winners last year as well. And I should also mention that um, Extreme Tech Challenge, we just selected our uh, finalist cohort this year, 80 companies across our seven different categories. Uh, So please, everybody, you can navigate to extremetechchallenge.org and start learning about how these exceptional companies are working to solve uh, big problems with technology. Um, So now I want to pivot to how, uh, Young, you went about driving innovation as corporate president and chief strategy officer, Samsung, one of the largest electronics corporations in the world. And big companies don't move fast, and there's certainly unique challenges to growing when you're already an industry leader. Um, You launched a number of of strategic initiatives, including uh, standing up the Samsung Catalyst Fund, which is a $500 million evergreen corporate venture capital vehicle for Samsung investing in new opportunities. How did you push beyond the, the boundaries and bridging the divide across geographies and cultures to drive this innovation focus? Actually, you know, I'm going to be honest, driving change in a large company is very difficult <laughs> because you already have $250 billion business that you're running and people don't want to get distracted. So the question is, how do you change without changing what will you're very strong at? So uh, this is about, this is why I think innovation is much harder in a incumbent than uh, newcomers and often the newcomers win because they can truly disrupt the players that are in. But Samsung actually has done pretty well in the past and being able to go from one business to the next business and being able to ship. I think part of that is ability to throw away what you have and being able to move into next business, but also anticipating where the future is going. I guess Wayne Gretzky, the hockey player from Canada, said, you know, don't chase the puck, but, uh, you know, go where the pucks are going to be coming. And I think that is right. You know, so being able to project where the opportunity is and being able to invest early and invest and betting on the right partners would be a great example. I think the example would be Samsung is now in biotech business. And you may wonder, oh, what do, what do they do in biotech? Actually, uh, a large amount of uh, antibody-based drug is actually made by Samsung for other brand, and and and, it's, and and that business really came from what I call new business creation team, thinking that our semiconductor history, being able to track small amount of the information, the cleanliness, the automation, the tracking, the regulatory process, all those the lessons we have learned could apply to even making drugs. And that is really orthogonal thinking. But if you think about it, logically, it actually does make sense. You know, in, instead of making traditional beer-making approach of brew, brewing the, you know, the drugs, you can actually automate it and using the latest high-tech technology to make it even more efficient and scalable the way it had been. So that's an example of the business that we create. And now it's the uh, uh, in Korean stock exchange with over $30 billion dollars. So that's a pretty good successful story of innovation. Yeah. And, and it's so wonderful um, to share your thoughts because you are one of the rare corporate executives that have uh, successes as entrepreneurs having built and exited companies. Um, so I think it's, it's really great to get your perspective having been a successful entrepreneur um, as well as an investor. Um, so it's, it's so wonderful to be here at the Horasis Global Meeting where over a thousand select world leaders are convening under this theme, Fostering Shared Humanity, um, and where we're discussing new ideas about how to advance sustainability development in the interests of the uh, public sector good. Um, so you touched on this already, but I want to close with this thought. Um, how can people work with us? How can people get engaged um, uh, with our mission at Extreme Tech Challenge? 
Well, I think the, uh, um, uh, you know, I think the, if you're an entrepreneur and if you want to make a big impact, you know, join us because that's what we are looking. We're looking for entrepreneurs that can be able to challenge and disrupt. If you're a venture capitalist and if you're a financier, you can back them up. If you're corporations, you can join us, you can sponsor the Extreme Challenge, and you can own that as a part of your agenda. I can tell you the example would be NXP ran an India XTC program, and their brand and our brand together, you can actually create over 200 companies that are come in to the tech for good. So I think this is a agenda that are not just belong to any small nonprofit, but it belongs to global agenda. And we want to just unleash the power of innovation and entrepreneurship and the venture capital to make it a bigger and, and accelerate uh, this whole process of uh, making a positive impact. Mm-hmm. And for anybody on the call who wants to get involved and feel inspired, please reach out to me and I'd love to engage in the conversation. Um, thank you for spending time with me today, Young. Um, to hear more great conversations between Young Sung and leading minds driving the next economy, please head to the next wave with Young Sung as he unpacks the brave new world of technology and business. And that concludes this session. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello, Victoria.